Hey guys, welcome to Friday. And to First Things First, I'm Jenna Wolf. That's the Hall of Famer Chris Carter, as he is every day. That is Nick Wright. How is everybody? Outstanding. You're in a good mood today. As, what happened? I mean, this is the first day I wake up it, since Father's Day 2016 sure. that the Golden State Warriors wake up facing elimination. That's a, that's a that's good day for sports fans, mood, man. CC. When Goliath is on the brink, Unless you're from the Bay, there's no hateration here, no Queen Petties on the after show, no, no pettiness, just when you wake up in the morning and the most talented team in NBA history is on the brink of that elimination. That puts you in a good mood. It's a good day. Either that or you wake up and you watch First Things First and Jenna Wolf has the hottest dress on anyone oh, you tell the camera have on. Thank you. Okay? You guys are very kind and very sweet. You, talk you about got that right. Mm, let's go. Jenna Wolf, let's go. Uh, let's job. go, Jenna. Dee, 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 dee. Awesome. Wow. A lot of moisturizing cream on today. Yeah, uh, if weird. I told you that neither James Harden nor Chris Paul were outstanding in a pivotal game five against the Golden State Warriors, would you still take the Rockets? Well, you should have. Just like in game four, this one came down to the wire, and the Warriors had the ball with a chance to win, but could not. Rockets turn around, pull this one out. They get a big win last night. 98 to 94 was your final. However, in the process, they might have lost Chris Paul. He had to leave the game with a hamstring injury. Could be a factor later in the game. We will get to all of it, but first, here's James Harden after the game. Can't explain it. We just can't talk about it. We just go out there and show it. You know, we don't, you know, we've been having that model all year. We don't, we don't really talk a lot. <clears throat> we just, we go out there and, and play hard and, and, and prove people, people wrong. Um, I mean, that's all we can do up to this point as well. You know, game six, we know the atmosphere. We know how crazy it's going to be. We know what's at stake. But, you know, we're going to go out there and just go and, and shoot our shots. And if they fall, they fall. They're, that's a bonus. But defensively, if we lock in like we've been doing, yeah, we got a chance. And a lot of James Harden's shots didn't fall last night. And when a reporter asked him about it, he said, hey, who cares? We won. That's all that really matters. Mm -hmm. CeCe, how are they able to do it? How do the Rockets beat the Warriors in game five? There's not one thing, but if there was one thing um, that led them to victory, and we've talked about it only a little bit because given the coach, given his history, how he runs his offense, given Harden, how he scores the ball, given the rest of the team, Chris Paul, and how they've operated and the success that they've had or lack of playoff success that they haven't been able to have, it all amounts to defense, grit, hustle, that's the difference in this Houston team and the other teams that I've seen D'Antonio coach, the other teams I've seen Chris Paul on, the other teams I've seen James Harden on, and they got some help. Like, the coach has got some help. He's got some guys willing to change their, their typical mode of operat, how they're going to go about doing business and play some defense. Pass up maybe a shot to get a guy a better shot. So you can see the total buy-in. But when you hold Golden State in the last two games to the numbers that they've held them to, you have to give credit to their defense. We talked about 2016 season. They were 26 in defense, went all the way up to number six this year. But even this season, they were 18th in defense, in total defense in the NBA, and moved up to that six mark. So those things are starting to play out in game four and game number five. And to me, those are the things that you can see. Those are the edge. Those are the differences in this Houston, the 2017-2018 version that's trying and really have chance to be world champions compared to the other teams I saw Chris Paul on, Harden on, yeah. and the ones that D'Antonio coached. Listen, the, to build on the defense part of it, from the beginning of the fourth quarter of game four to two minutes left in the first quarter of game five, in 22 minutes of basketball, the most talented team ever put together scored 22 points. One point a minute might get it done in like seventh, eighth grade junior high league. <laughs> that doesn't get it done in the NBA. The defense was not quite as good after that, but still very good the rest of the way. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way you can overcome the MVP going 0 for 11 from 3. That's the only way you can overcome Chris Paul being 0 for 7 from the field in the first half. I Yesterday on the show, I will, I will make a bit of a confession here. I had a little bit of inside information when I said, I think the Rockets are going to have one of those three-point avalanche games. I knew going into the game that they the game plan was shoot 40 to 45 threes. Dan Tony said after the game, I told him, we got to shoot 40 to 45 threes. Now, they shot 43 of them. They couldn't make them. They were 13 of 43. They won anyway. Trevor Ariza made one basket. They won anyway. This, 
what they were able to do last night with the league MVP having a bad game by any measure, with Chris Paul being awful in the first half to then very good in the second half, it doesn't happen if the defense isn't there to keep you within striking distance. And those early. aren't things that we, we talked about. We talked about, and, and Jenna, you, you held Nick and I to this, well, you guys said that Chris Paul and, and, and Harden don't play, Both of them. Don't play outstanding. Yeah. They don't have a chance. Well, we didn't know. And or if we were being honest, we were wrong yep. because the way this team came together, I mean, you're holding them under 95 points, under 100 points. You're going to have a chance. You, we couldn't see that part of it. So those team aspects of what they're doing, the total buy in, there's no one that could have pr predicted um, besides shooting that number of threes that they were going to get that type of response. And. We never thought there was a path to victory with them not shooting outstanding from the three-point line. And the path to victory over the last two games with Harden missing 20 consecutive threes. Harden has missed his last 20 three-pointers. In that stretch, the Rockets have outscored the Warriors by 12 points. And I want to give Dan... Wait, wait, that's... Wait, wait, that, that's... That's crazy. Since Harden is, Harden is over his last 23s, in that stretch, it's from midway second quarter of game four until where we sit here this morning, the Rockets have outscored the Warriors by 12 points while Harden hasn't made a three. And here's where I'll give D'Antoni credit. One of, the, one of the reasons they're playing better defensively is they, while D'Antoni's like, we're not going to change anything, we're, not gonna, we're gonna do what we do, they did change one of the things they're doing defensively. They're not switching every screen. No. Which is preventing Golden State from being able to slip the screens to get easy layups. Yes. They are switching smarter. And the other thing D'Antoni's done is say, we're gonna play seven dudes. I don't care that the seventh of the seven was unemployed a few months ago. We're, Joe Johnson, you've got you've got all NBA pedigree. Sit down. Uh, Ryan Anderson, you're making twenty one million dollars a year. Sit down. Luke Richard Mabamute, you've been excellent for us all year. You're injured. You're not yourself. Sit down. We're rolling with our seven guys, and we're good with it. Except that the Rockets wake up this morning unsure of what's going to be from Chris Paul, who had to leave the game with a hamstring injury. Mm -hmm. How do you move forward from here unsure of what, what you get from him, and, and who would you even replace him with? Well, to me, it's no different than Golden State, their adjustment they had to make with Clay. Late in the playoffs, Nick and I always talk about this, the fatigue of the regular season. We're not surprised Chris Paul got hurt. We're just glad it's not his Achilles. He's been dealing with a bad Achilles on his right side. Jenna, you know, is a great athlete in fitness that you know, you know you're going to overcompensate. So either you're going to hurt your knee with the Achilles bottom you, or you're going to hurt your hamstring. And that's what you see with Chris Paul. You know, he had a bad right Achilles. He was really having problems with it in game number three. I thought that's what had happened. I thought when, I, when he didn't I get up to go of. up the court, I I'm thought, glad he grabbed his hamstring. I was like, did this guy pop his Achilles? Because if he pops his Achilles, forget, of course he's done for the year. But at his age, his size, you worry about, is he done for the future as well? I... The, you're, you said Clay. You mean the same as what Golden State's doing without Iggy? Is no, with, with Clay when he got nicked. Oh, when he got nicked in the yeah, game. Yeah, you okay. make adjustments because I believe Chris Paul's going to try to play. Yes. Like those types of players that have the type of resume he's got, they're going to try to be out there. And the luxury that they have that Chris Paul has never had at any point in his career, he's not the predominant ball handler. He's basically a spot-up shooter, and then every once in a while, they give it to him to go isolation. I believe that part of the offense that be, can be replaced. But from a defensive standpoint, you can't replace how good Chris Paul is as far as a defender. But also, the Warriors were able to win without Iggy in the lineup and with a Clay Thompson, who even though he dropped, what, 23 or something last well, night? The Warriors haven't won without Iggy in the lineup in this series yet. But, yes. they, 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 but, they, but they wouldn't have to rely on him. He's correct. not their go-to guy. Oh. And while the Rockets won last night without both these guys being great, this is just one game where they went without both of them being oh, at least contributing. Listen, I, the, I have not yet fully entertained the idea that Chris Paul could be out for the series. Not only because it's, it would be unfair to him and be unfair to basketball fans, but I've talked ad nauseum about how many lucky breaks, injury breaks the Warriors have gotten, whether it's Kawhi going down, whether it's Kyrie and Kevin Love going down, whether we can go down the list. Chris Paul is, you can argue, much like we do with the Warriors, who's the best, who's the most important. He's not the best player on the Rockets. You can argue he's the most important. The, their only, in my opinion, path to victory if he doesn't play in a game 
is what I thought they were going to do last night, which is unconscious from three. Like the where just a three-point barrage. But it makes them – you can't play six guys. If Chris Paul's out, see, you've got to now extend the rotation. No. Now guys who haven't been getting minutes have to get minutes. No, and that doesn't – just because Chris Paul, if he decides not to play two, that doesn't mean that the rotation only increases by one. Right. I believe D'Antoni goes back and maybe plays three guys. Exactly. Right. Chris, Chris Paul goes back and plays eight guys. I have an eight-man rotation. And I believe the ball handling skills, too, because the way they run their offense, that can be replaced. And Chris Paul, you saw it yesterday. He, there was a great moment before he got hurt when Harden was clearly exhausted. There were about three minutes left in the game. And Chris Paul, during a timeout, just starts jumping up and down in Harden's face, basically saying, we're not allowed to be tired right now. We've got to go. Like, that, I know he doesn't have a championship. He is a championship-level leader. They need him desperately the rest of the way. All right, the Rockets now up 3-2 in the Western Conference Finals. In the East, can LeBron will the Cavs to a Game 7 in Boston? That's next. Game 6 tonight in Cleveland. Boston won Game 5. Those they guys were, in Wisconsin are frisky, though. They were good at home, and LeBron was tired on the road. Boston hoping to be good on the road, and LeBron rested at home. LeBron James faced an elimination in the Eastern Conference playoffs. Just for the first time since 2010, here he is talking about it after Game 5. I'm going back home. We have a comfort level, and our, a lot of our guys have a comfort level of being back home and, and playing off the fans and playing off our crowd, playing off that court, you know, being more comfortable being back home for Game 6. So, um, you know, we look forward to having an opportunity to uh, force a Game 7. Um, so, um, you know, the game is... Uh, it's up to us to see if we can, uh, you know, come back here for one more. All right, Nick, besides LeBron James putting up 100 points on his own, what do the Cavs need to do to win this game? Well, I reject the premise of the question, the <laughs> besides the LeBron James part of it. This is the, statistically speaking, the greatest elimination game player in the history of the sport. The, the nobody's ever averaged more points per game in elimination games. We talked about it going into game seven against Indiana. How since he walked off the court against Dallas, the lowest moment of his career, he has faced elimination 13 times. He's 10-3 and three in those games. He scored at least 30 12 times. The one time he didn't was a game seven of the finals triple-double. By the way, that stretch started in a game six in Boston in 2012, arguably the most important game of LeBron's career is 45-15-5. and five. So game seven I believe the Cavs will need more of a collaborative effort because it will be in Boston. Game six, LeBron can win this game by himself. LeBron can go out and beat Boston at home by himself, and that's about what I expect to see. I expect you to say that, but if that happens, because I saw in game number two, LeBron had a type of performance that would beat a normal team. They didn't do it. This Celtics team, not as talented. They're two superstars, well-documented. Not there. But as a team... This is, this is a team that can't be beat by one player, all right? And that's what I believe, all right? We're going to come on this show on Monday, and people are going to be shocked. LeBron James not going to be in the playoffs. What are we going to do? Because I don't believe that this unit, that not only can they win a game in Boston, but I wouldn't be shocked that Boston won game number six in Cleveland. Like, based on the way the team has played, the younger players adjusted in, in game number four, and the way they played the second quarter, third quarter, and the fourth quarter, and the way they went back to game, um, game number five and held their business in Boston, I wouldn't be shocked at all if Boston won tonight see, in Cleveland. See, I agree with you that you can't just say LeBron will be enough for them to win a game in Boston because you're right. We saw game two in Boston. LeBron played brilliantly, a 40-point triple-double, and, and they, they lost. lost. But the, we can show the audience the home road discrepancy. But this is two different teams now. Like, Boston is a great team at home, and they have been bad on the road. Is one great player enough to beat them on the road? I mean, I, I've seen it happen in this postseason already. I saw Giannis do it. I, I, I saw LeBron do it twice already. The Go ahead. Who has more support, Giannis or LeBron? Giannis. Oh, okay. But I don't think yeah. But Gian I expect LeBron to play better than Giannis's best game. Like the. Uh, the uh, of course, that kind of math, Nick. Of course, yeah. I expect LeBron to play better. But basketball doesn't work like that. 
All right? The backcourt of the Cavaliers has been horrible. And there's nothing. There's no number that we can pull. Dusty, get me a stat that's going to tell me JR's going to play better, that they're going to play. There's, there is no stat. So it's a, you know what we are back to now? We're back to where we were at the, the, the Pacers series. Man, we just believe in LeBron. It's just blind faith. But what if that doesn't work? What if that doesn't? What if that doesn't work over the next two games? Which I don't believe it's going to work because of lack of support. But listen, I am just real quick. I apologize. I, I, in four games seven. He needs the backcourt to be better. They need because we when when you're talking about that, how bad the backcourt's been again. That's the games in Boston. So what if they lose tonight? What are we going to come on here on Monday? How are we going to explain it to people? If they lose. All right, because our job is supposed to give people some type of preview. Mm -hmm. We got two games before we're going to be on TV. Mm -hmm. And there's a chance they could lose tonight. I would so be. our job is to paint a picture as if they could lose tonight. Because if they did, tonight's game is far more important than talking about game number seven. Sure, but I the, I feel like a lot of your what, the, what, what you're describing are scenarios that I think only apply to the Boston team in TD Garden. The back, the Boston backcourt has not been better than the Cavs backcourt. Oh, okay. Well, let's just do the stats of the backcourt at home. How great they've been. What? They it's, haven't. They haven't been good. All right. Which they've been better. On? The okay, Cavs backcourt. Sure, absolutely. They've been better at home. They but played they into about a draw. Right. They still have been below the NBA average. Oh, of course. Uh, I, That's all I'm saying. I, I agree with that. And if you're if you're saying what are we going to do? Like, how am I going to explain it if the Cavs lose it tonight? Uh, listen, I have to own it. I will have I will have been wrong about this from the beginning, but I don't I do not think that when the other team doesn't have an established superstar, no matter how good the supporting cast is, no matter how bad Cleveland's supporting cast is, that Cleveland's going to lose a home elimination game in the Eastern Conference. I don't believe that. Question: You rejected the, my question and my premise that LeBron needs to score 100 points mm -hmm. and not rely on anything else. I almost reject yours a little that that he could single-handedly go out and win this game. Ty Lue didn't know really how to manage the last game because he didn't know who to rely on. Mm -hmm. I, who, who, how does he make adjustments now for this game, not knowing is he going to play Kyle Korver? Is he going to keep the same backcourt? Do you rely on J.R. Smith? I mean, how do you no, answer you, those you, questions? You, you bring up a good point, Jenna. In an elimination game, how patient can I be with guys I've depended on? Absolutely. It's legitimate. Everyone should be asking themselves that question. How long can they stay? Do they get go with Jetty Osman? You know, do they give him some minutes? Like, there's so many questions surrounding the Cavs that are legitimate. He made a huge mistake in game number five. With All right, Kyle as far, Corver, as, far as, as Kyle, the number of minutes he played, worrying about the Celtics rotation compared to doing what they do best, and that's put the best shooters on the court. So all those things are on board. What I just try to do, Jenna, is give people a picture of the of the scenarios of what can happen. And in this game tonight, it's not like Vegas thinks this is one lopsided game. Cleveland is going to win. If they don't win tonight, I just try to give people things they should look at for the upset. Right, and I just the, – the, the upset would be – it would be the most shocking result of the NBA playoffs thus far. Okay. It would be more shocking than Toronto. But we would at least have our fan base prepared for that. Okay, well, that, that's your job then. Today. Uh, that's what I'm doing. That, that's fine. The, the, <laughs> the, the I don't. I the the the, your, the point you're making about listen, Clarkson. Maybe he shouldn't be in the rotation. Uh, Ty Lue making adjustments. All those things are applicable for Sunday. For tonight, I don't think the game will be close, and I think it will be because of that guy. I guess we'll see. We'll see in about. 13 hours. All right, that's the story there. We'll go back to the Western Conference Finals on the other side. Coming up, who is to blame for the Warriors now being down 3-2 in that series to the Houston Rockets? Next, this is First Things First. Rockets won game five. We may have lost Chris Paul in the process of winning game five. Injured his hamstring in the final minute. Had to leave the court. His status for game six is unknown. Chris, do the Rockets have any chance if CP3 can't go? Absolutely. They're the best team in basketball and have been over the course of not a month, not two months, but the course of the NBA season. Yes, they do. Can they win one game as an organization without Chris Paul? Chris Paul, I do believe they can because they're not using their bench now. They do have three players I do believe will get in that rotation. Last year, Eastern Conference, or Western Conference semifinals, Kawhi Leonard, Gets dinged at the end of game five, a game the Spurs win. He is then not in game six against the Rockets. Rockets should win it. The Spurs end up winning that game to go on to the Western Conference Finals. I say that, say this. You can win one game. Like, if this was the beginning of the series, you got no shot of winning a series without Chris Paul. You can win one game without Chris Paul. I And he still might play. We don't know yet. 
All right, moving on to the Knicks. We finally heard from the unicorn about his new head coach. Kristaps Porzingis expressed his excitement over hiring David Fisdale. He tweeted, just had a great conversation on the phone with Coach Fizz. Man, I'm excited. Let's go. CC, how do you expect Fizz to do in New York? Um, I expect Fizz to do well. I'm, I'm pulling for Fizz. I'm a fan of the, the way he coaches the game from his days in Miami, where I was a season ticket holder with LeBron there. And it's nice to see that his excitement, he does have that type of personality that is infectious. I can see Chris Tapp getting off the phone being like, okay, never met the guy. I like this guy. He has that type of approach and that type of a demanding personality. Most important job for the new Knicks head coach, whoever it was going to be, to have a good relationship with the franchise. That's Chris Stapp's Porzingis. We, there were reports this week they almost traded him to Phoenix. We know Phil Jackson never had a good relationship with him in the front office. That's now solved, it would appear. This is very, very important and a great first win for David Fisdale. Absolutely. And you need to have a relationship with Chris Stapp's brother, too. I feel like he's got a yeah. role in the You're process. Right. You You're might right. hear about him later on. <laughs> the all-NBA teams were announced yesterday. Damian Lillard was named first-team guard alongside the assumed MVP, James Harden. Nick? Should Lillard have made first-team NBA? Absolutely. This is a great accomplishment for him. The Steph Curry had the stats to do it, but only played 50 games. CP3 didn't make any of the teams because of games missed. Kyrie, same situation. Lillard played the full season, got his team to the three seed, was excellent. It's a regular season award. He 100% deserved it. Yeah, this is not some type of reward they're going to give you for having a good season. Two seasons ago, oh, they're going to make up for something. You have to earn yourself on all NBA first team. One of the great honors to have in the NBA, man, you're talking about hard to make it? There's only one point guard spot? Man, he earned it. He really did earn it this year. In a, in a, in a time in basketball, we have a lot of great point guards. That's a good point. All right, finally, another career accomplishment for LeBron James. He was named to first team all NBA for the 12th time. He passed Kobe Bryant and Karl Malone for the most selections in NBA history. How impressive is this accomplishment for LeBron, Nick? So this is the all NBA team is very important when you're evaluating guys historically and career wise and the forward spot because the way it works is there's two guards, two forwards, one center. So since LeBron's come into the league, the people he's been competing with for one of those two first team spots are Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett, Dirk Nowitzki, Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard as of late, that for 12 years, 12 of LeBron's 15 years, he's been one of the two best players at the deepest position in the league. It's, it, to me, it's remarkable. And LeBron now has more first-team All-NBA selections than Jordan had complete years in Chicago. That's not a LeBron's greater than Jordan thing. That's a just think of how, how many memories you have for Jordan's time in Chicago. His entirety there of complete seasons, he played 11 full years there. LeBron's been one of the best forwards in the league 12 times. He has two other, he has a second and a third team as well, so or two second teams as well. So 14 is 15 years he's been on a All-NBA team. Yeah, it's very, very important. And for those who are LeBron historians or the fans of LeBron, this will be one of the topics they'll be able to go to if they're trying to make an honest comparison between LeBron and the other great players, most notably Michael Jordan. And this difference right here in how long he could stay in his prime, how long could he stay as one of the best players in the NBA, that's going to be one of the message points if he's ever going to catch up with Jordan or ever go beyond Michael Jordan. It's, man, NBA, first team, 12 years He's going to add on to that. Now, can he get another ring? Because those will be the arguments. that Because the, 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 the playoff record, finals record, the six MVPs, that is unapproachable. So LeBron can only go to these other little areas that I believe being valuable, critical to the argument for people like Nick Wright. And this is because for some people, the Jordan six rings will always make Jordan the greatest player ever, six for six. Our friend Isaiah Thomas, when he was here, the guy he brings up is Kareem. Like, if we, the LeBron, Kareem, totality of their careers, that's where this is most applicable. When you look at how great, how long Kareem was great, how long he extended his prime, that's the territory LeBron was approaching and is now, I don't know if he's quite surpassed the length of Kareem's prime, but he's neck and neck with him and doesn't appear to be slowing down. So impressive. All right, back to the only basketball game that mattered last night, only the basketball game, also the only basketball game that was even played. Rockets <laughs> beat the Warriors. Stop, Nick. Rockets beat the Warriors in an ugly game, but it was a pivotal one. They now take a 3-2 series lead. The Warriors have now dropped two playoff games in a row. They haven't done that 
since the 2016 finals. However, as expected, Steve Kerr says he's not worried heading into game six. I feel great about where we are right now. And that may sound crazy, um, but I, I feel it. I know exactly what I'm seeing out there. And we defended them beautifully tonight. We got everything we needed. Just too many turnovers, too many reaches. Um, and if we settle down a little bit, we're going to be in really good shape. It's a big statement there. Really good shape because they're not in, in great shape right now. What do you think about what Steve Kerr said, CeCe? No, oh, I don't believe him. I, I can't. I can't believe after that game because uh, I listened to Draymond because I went back and listened to Draymond after game number four. And Draymond was like, man, you know, we're pissed. We, we gave a game away. I think they gave this game away. I mean, you can't expect Houston to shoot the ball that poorly again. You can't expect Chris Paul to be out of the game in the most critical time again. Like, you can't expect that. Like, in Houston, like, if there was a game seven, and you say, hey, Steve Kerr, you have the same scenario again. He'd be like, yeah, absolutely. Sign me up for that. But that would be after they had one game number six, not knowing where Iggy's going to be back. So, no, I don't believe him. Now, this is the first time... Nick, that they've been down the series since when? First time they've been trailing in a series since before they got Durant. When they're down 3-1 to OKC and then down 3-2 to OKC. Yeah, like, and, and, and the reason why I know Jenna, because I work with a guy. Oh, shit, I ain't worried. <laughs> Shaking his feet like the duck on the pond. Right. Them feet up under. <laughs> <laughs> LeBron, 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 LeBron. No, Steve Curry, he should be concerned. This is the best team that he's faced in this run that they've been on. This is... The only team that had home court advantage mm -hmm. against them. And do they have the matchups? Do they have the firepower? No, they can't outshoot Houston. It's the first time they faced anyone in this run that'd be like, man, we can't outshoot them. There got to be some other ways that we got to try to beat them. In the last two games, they had a chance to win, but their inability to run their offense in the last minute of the game. I mean, there you it's go. It's shocking. There, there. I mean, there you go. They. James Harden drove to the basket, kicked it to Eric Gordon to hit a three with a minute 20 left. That put Houston up by four points. Mm -hmm. That was also the last basket Houston made. Minute 20 left, Houston's done making baskets. Houston's done scoring except for in foul situations where the Warriors are fouling to stop the clock. Go ahead. And in a lot of playoff situations, championship situations, that's all the field goals you get. It's normally a free throw shooting contest after that. So, so, so that's a typical situation they were in when he hits that. So three. Houston doesn't make another basket. The rest of the way, let's look at what Golden State runs, who gets the shots, and who is not involved. Draymond gets a three. Great make by him. Quinn Cook takes their most important shot of the season with Steph running wide open. That ain't great. Steph Curry misses a very tough layup. And then the final possession of the game, you're kicking it up to Draymond. Let's show this again. Kevin Durant, is he standing out of bounds? You're going to see someone fly into the screen at the end here. It's not Kevin Durant. He never comes into the frame. See, you told me that Kevin Durant knew he made a mistake at the end of game four. Absolutely. That he said, I knew I should have taken that shot. I knew I... Well, he... He couldn't have scripted a better opportunity to make up for it than at the end of game number five. Four possessions. Draymond gets a three, and credit Draymond, who is never afraid of anything, going back to game seven against mm -hmm. the Cavs when Draymond had a brilliant basketball game. Draymond takes a shot. Quinn Cook, who was in the G he was so League. Wide. He was so wide open, he had enough time to take a dribble. Yeah, I mean, he fumbled the ball. He couldn't believe it. The next possession down, Steph, I'll give Steph credit. Steph attacked the basket. Really tough shot, but at least he was in attack mode. And then that last play, when you have to, you know the, the Rockets have a foul to give, so there's a little, you can't quite do the easy math. They screwed up the rebound, so they couldn't advance it to midcourt. But Katie's not involved. What was Katie, if Draymond doesn't turn the ball over, I'm just curious, what's Katie's plan 46 feet from the basket with one foot out of bounds? With four seconds left. Every coach I ever had has said, hey, man, you got a guy next to you? Uncover. Go to an open area. Try to create some space for yourself. He, he was, didn't move. Was Quinn Cook the plan ever drawn? Was it, was it ever drawn up that Quinn Cook was going to get the ball and take the shot? This is the second straight game that ended like this. The last game that came down to the wire 
we talked about it, and CC, you were surprised. You're like, I'm surprised there wasn't a better play drawn up or any semblance of a play. It looked like everybody was a mess. It kind of appeared that it was this way, too. Uh, absolutely, Jenna. It's a, it's a great observation. And no, they didn't draw up anything. Well, Chris, how do you know that? The reason why? Because they hadn't played one single minute with that lineup that they had with Quinn Cook in the game all season. We're at game, what, 96? In that, the season? Now, let me say this. That's remarkable. That was the Why? first. That was the first minute I had not seen that. That was the first minute they had played with that five-man lineup. Yes. I That's, guess it makes sense because Cook was brought up when Steph was hurt, so why would he be out there in those spots? Yeah, so yeah, Jim, to your question, there's no way they called up a play because Steve Kerr had never anticipated that lineup being in the game. And the way the dysfunction, the lack of spacing, the lack of movement lets you know they didn't have a great concept for what they're going to do. So in the last two games... If I'm Steve Kerr, the reason why I'm concerned is I know I've man, I've crushed this NBA the last four years. I know I've only won two of the championships. I gave one away up three to one. But these closeout situations, how to close out games, you know something? We're not real good at that. Well, you know why? You've been so dominant. You got such an access of shooters and scores and great players that that's a part of the game that you're not really, really good at. Who's going to shoot the ball at the end of the game? The last time I remember... There's two times that stick out in my mind of the Warriors in a theoretical big game or a definite big game, and they, they had the, the play you remember. One is obviously Kevin Durant last year coming up court after the Corver missed at the three on LeBron. And the one prior to that was Steph from like 38 feet in the game against Oklahoma City, the 73-win year in overtime, if you remember. That game was on a Friday night. It was in overtime. He pulls up from almost 40. And they're not in these spots a lot. So they don't have a lot of experience in these spots. But I, Kevin Durant in these fourth quarters now, this is going to be a thing. You can't be one for five in game four in the fourth quarter and in game, and game five in the fourth quarter, 0 oh for four. You can't be shooting 18% and 12% from three and averaging three points in the fourth quarter when in the first three quarters you look like the most unstoppable scorer in the league and when fatigue is not really an excuse here because he is getting rested. He is getting subbed out. He's not playing 44 minutes a night. Like, game four was the only game where he played plus 40 minutes in this entire series. But for this whole team, how, what percentage of the season have they really only had to turn it on the first or the second or the third quarter? No. There are so few times where they've had to really, like, come from behind and play hard in the fourth quarter and try to win a game in the last minute. And, Jenna, that's why I believe that this team is not as prepared as the first Golden State team before they had KD. When they were trying to win as many games as possible, Possible, where winning was important to them. The regular season was paramount to them. Now, we saw them sleepwalk through the regular season, and now you start getting in, in close and contested series and games. You can see that this is something they haven't worked on an awful lot. And this is why, at the beginning of the show, as, as petty or maybe even unprofessional as some would see it seemed for me to be happy the Rockets won. It is good for basketball fans for the regular season to matter. And if Houston yes. wins this series, then it matters. the regular season will have yeah. mattered. The Warriors just saying we're going to flip a switch. We don't care about home court. Mm -hmm. We don't care about any of this. It will bite them. It will have bitten them if they lose the series. Now, they haven't lost this series yet. Still got to beat them one more time. But that's why, that's why as a basketball fan, it's easy to – I know a lot of people that don't like the way the Rockets play, don't like James Harden. They, they, mm -hmm. they think CP3 is they, – they've never liked him. They, they don't like D'Antoni's style. And they're rooting for Houston because it will make the regular season feel like it's not – nonsense right. like it actually has some impact and we saw that the way game four ended was a mental blow for the Warriors let's see if game the way game five ended will be as well all right coming up who'll step up for the Dallas Cowboys next year let's switch gears talk some football on the other side first things first Back here, first things first, we're about three months away from game one of the NFL season. Cowboys open up against the Panthers. Who will Dak Prescott be throwing the ball to that afternoon? It won't be Jason Witten, and it won't be Des Bryant. They'll have a new receiving core in Dallas with a whole new set of expectations. Cowboys receiver Deontay Thompson had this to say, quote, I'm excited to be in a group of guys who are hungry and want to prove the world wrong. I don't really have too much social media stuff, so I barely hear it. But we know what they say. But we'll be having this discussion in November, and it will be totally different. 
All right, CC, I'll start with you. How much do the Cowboys need from their receivers to be successful this year? Oh, here we go. Watch Chris Carter get another group of wide receivers in the NFL mad at him. I've been doing this for years. <laughs> And, did it uh, start with Seattle and Doug Baldwin, or did something? It's, it's, it's been it's been long before. It, okay. It's been it's been long before. Even back to T.O. when T.O. was opposite of Jerry Rice, I didn't know who he was, and T.O. took that as a personal indictment. Is that where that him. started? That's yeah. The, yeah, because I didn't know who he was. I didn't know he was going to be a Hall of Famer. <laughs> not your fault, CC. No, it's not your not fault. Not. I thought J.J. Stokes was going to be the best young receiver on that team yeah, back then. Absolutely. So did they. <laughs> but, <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. So let's add another list. Here we go. And, and and I laugh about this is because I bump I, I bump into Julian Edelman and I ask him about his, his knee being repaired and everything. He said things are going well and everything. I told him, man, I really respect your game, respect you as a player, how you've developed and everything. He's like, yeah, you know, I like you on TV, but I gotta I gotta be truthful with you. Didn't always like you, and I was like, why? He's like, oh man, I used to hear you. You used to tell me, you know, I was just a quarterback playing slot receiver and everything. And I was like, well, where was I wrong? He was like, you know, people just don't believe in you. I said, what was I supposed to believe in? What had you done? He was like, no, you know, I just use it as motivation. You're a great wide receiver, and I just really wanted you to say great things about me. And I said, listen, man, it's a trade-off here. I'm going to be on TV, okay? Do something great. I'll say something great about you. Awesome. All right, Deontay Thompson, I've been watching him since high school. Hot, right. Okay? <laughs> Bell Glaze, the University of Florida. Like, he's been a role player even at the University of Florida, let alone in the National Football League. So I don't care what they read on social media. I don't care what they – this is what – the underdog role is all about. Oh, they don't believe in us. You know, if, if you're undersized, how am I supposed to believe in you? If you've been a backup, how am I supposed to believe? If you've never had a 1,000-yard season, how am I supposed <coughs> to believe? They have a bunch of guys who are misfits, and now they don't have a lead dog. They don't have a number one receiver. None of these guys is a number one receiver. That's not my fault. That's Dallas's fault. Now, will these guys try to come together as a group and collectively get it done? Yeah, you can do that when you got Tom Brady. You can do that when you got Aaron Rodgers. When you got some of the greater throwers, we don't see this happen. Unnamed guys being able to duplicate productivity that we see with big name guys. In that guys. unit. No, 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 no. Only when you have one of the top five passers in the league do we see you able to get away with that. Listen, I think you're being a little unfair, Deontay Thompson. 77 catches, 1,032 yards, four. Oh, that's not last year. That's his six year career. My bad. No, no, no. You're being totally. Yeah, so fair. it's my fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Listen, the, you, you're totally correct that. Sometimes, out of nowhere, oh, my God, Julius Thomas. No, Nobody knew about him. One He's one of the best receiver tight ends in football. Oh, that's when he was paired up with Peyton Manning. Like, mm. oh, oh, Wes Welker. The, the Dolphins didn't even want him. Like, and, and now he's now he's has four straight amazing seasons. Oh, he was paired up with Tom Brady and then Peyton Manning. Like, there, there are guys that you can come out of nowhere and all of a sudden you only ask them to do what they're best at. They are always put in a position to succeed. Something you taught me that I love, the ball speaks to them. Yes. So wherever the ball is passed, this is an important note for it, whether you're talking about Cole Beasley or Terrence Williams or Alan Hearns, some, a benefit I don't think any of these guys have really ever had in their career, and I don't know that they'll have this year with Dak, which is when, when you are playing with a great quarterback and a ball is thrown to a certain place, what it tells you, as opposed to when you're not playing with a great quarterback and the ball might be thrown to a certain place because he was off. To explain the, what, what the ball speaking to you means, because that's one of the reasons these under-skilled guys can turn into the best versions of themselves. Right, the ball speaks to them and makes them better because it lets them know what the coverage is and it lets them know where the other defenders on the field are. Say you have a shallow cross. You have a guy in your face, man-to-man. -man. You go up underneath him. The quarterback throws the ball in front of you. You think it's man-to-man, -man, but the guy could have jammed you and dropped off, all right? But the quarterback throwing it in front of you, he lets you know there's green grass in front of you. It's probably going to be man-to-man. -man. If the quarterback throws the ball at your back shoulder, it's like, watch out, man. You got heavy artil artillery in front of you. Slow yourself down and go back the other way. So a great quarterback, it does help unknown. It does help guys who have been number threes, number four receivers trying to come together. And I've only been wrong about this one time, and that was the Seattle Seahawks. And that was because of Doug Baldwin. Doug Baldwin made me wrong. I said they were just ordinary guys. They were just role players. But Doug Baldwin stepped up his game. Now, as a group, 
They were very effective as a group being on a running team, a lot like Dallas, with a young quarterback. They proved me to be wrong. And Doug, Doug Baldwin knows it. I apologize to him. Doug Baldwin went on to become a Pro Bowl receiver. Right. Which one of these guys is going to step up and be the Doug Baldwin to make me wrong? So there's two ways it can work in Dallas. One, if they succeed as the underdog receiving core and somehow a bunch of no-names are going to come together mm -hmm. and become this unit that no one expected. Or two, Dak Prescott has to come out and have a lights-out year in year three. Do we expect that to happen? Well, the, to the Doug Baldwin thing, just quickly, he partially, he, he made you partially, he, he became a better player, but also I would imagine part of your analysis baked into that was you didn't think at the time Seattle had a Tom Brady at quarterback. And Russell Wilson ain't Tom Brady, but, man, he's turned into an amazing, to me, yes. a top-five quarterback in this league. Yes, absolutely. And he made that jump from a running defensive team to now I'm the guy. Right. You and can back me up 40 times, 50 times, and you can win doing that. And so I don't know, to answer your question, I don't see that type of leap coming from Dak. Like, Doug, Russell Wilson to me is a top five quarterback in this league. R right now, Dak's fighting to become a top 15 quarterback in this league. It's an enormous jump to go from there to there. Because even Russell Wilson's first year, second year, third year, you could see some flashes of it. The reason this is going to be so hard for Dallas is you talk uh, all the time about uh, every number two wants to be a number one. Every number three wants to be a number two. Yes. I look at Dallas. I think Alan Hearns is a legitimate number two receiver. Yes. He won't have to be their number one. Everyone else on this team is a four, L right? Like, their number two is going to have to be their number one. And Cole Beasley is an excellent fourth receiver. You can deal with him as your third receiver. Terrence Williams, be an excellent fourth receiver. He can be a third receiver. Yeah, you can't have him as no damn designated driver, though. No, no, no. No, you can't have that. That's a fair point. Uh, <laughs> I didn't expect that one. Deontay Thompson has been a sixth receiver. Barely make an NFL roster. But if you add all those up, what number do you get? Oh, that's not quite how the, that math oh, works. Oh, okay. So that's like, not how it works? So, okay, no, I, didn't, no, I wasn't no, sure. So, what's okay. the path, so what <laughs> is the path to the Cowboys in your eyes having a great offense? They have to be outstanding running the football. They have to be outstanding from a turnover standpoint. They have to be amazing defense, winning the turnover margin. And this is what this wide receiver group, what they want to be. They want to be dependable. They want to generate first downs and generate big plays and touchdowns in the red zone. All right, now, if I can get two out of those three, if they can be very, very dependable moving the chains on third down, and if they can either be great with the deep ball, I'm talking about passes over 20 yard, explosive passes, which they haven't been good at, or just be outstanding in the red zone. That's what the Dallas Cowboys needs from this wide receiving core. And of all those things, the running game we know is probably locked in and maybe the defense is, so there's a lot of questions still to be answered in Dallas. All right, we'll take a break. Coming up, Chris Broussard joins us to discuss how the Rockets we're able to take down the Warriors next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. Yet another Chris is with us. Chris Broussard joins the conversation. Chris. Oh, good to see you, brother. What a game here. last night. You can't say it didn't surprise you. Just a little bit? A little bit? Were you a little it bit was just, I, I, I don't know if it's surprise is the right it. word. Yeah, it was just a, I thought it was a great game. A lot good. of people complaining, saying it wasn't well played. It was playoff basketball. It wasn't well broadcasted. It was or commentated. <laughs> it was a great basket. I thought it was. I a thought ton it was a great game. Watch. It reminded me just quickly. It, re it was better played than these games, but it reminded me of when I used to cover the Knicks, Knicks and Heat. the Heat series in the 90s. that were terrible basketball games. Mm -hmm. But with two minutes left, it was always within the balance. Yeah, that's what, what made I was it exciting. Nick, that, that I've seen with the NBA and critical sporting events that. At the most critical time, it's almost impossible to play great because of the stakes, because of the pressure, because of the defense. Yes. So I don't yes. expect that even though I thought the game was a great game, aesthetically to the viewers, sometimes people look at it and be like, ah, it could have been a better game. So let me just at least set the table. Rockets go ahead and take a 3-2 series lead over the Warriors. 98-94 was your final. I think some people thought it was ugly. It was a little low scoring the first quarter. Shots weren't going in. Mm -hmm. Both Harden and CP3 struggled early on, and then the Warriors struggled late. But all that, how were the Rockets, Chris, able to beat the Warriors last well, you night? How do you break it down? When your top two players shoot 11 for 40, when you shoot 37% as a team and mm -hmm. win – Against a great offensive team, there's only one explanation, defense. And what has happened, you never thought you'd say that about Mike D'Antoni, coach no. team. I, I know he's got Jeff Bizdelic as kind of his defensive coordinator, yeah. but give D'Antoni credit for setting that up, okay, and letting Bizdelic do his thing. But what they have done 
is I've said it before, they have baited, going switching everything, they've baited Golden State to play in ISO basketball. Golden State, we know they've talked about passes. They are very, you know, they're adamant about the number of passes they get per game. They are throwing 58 fewer passes per game in this mm -hmm. series than they did in the regular season and mm. the first two rounds. They are going ISO almost three times as much as they did in the first two rounds in the regular season. Yep. Their assist, they led the league with assists, almost 30 a game, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And now they had 14 in game four, 18 last night. Like, they have gotten away from themselves. And I've said it before, what made them special was all the motion, the fluidity. Because it you made them so hard to guard. Anymore. Exactly. It, you don't see that anymore. It was. That, that is, and I know, listen, for about 20 months or 18 months, however long, my opinion that the Warriors shouldn't have signed Kevin Durant has looked crazy. We'll see how it looks in about 96 hours. But the reason, the reason that I initially felt it in my heart was because th they were playing a style of basketball I'd never seen a team play at that high of a level. The, the, the freedom of movement, the sharing of the basketball, it, and I thought that it elevated Steph to a level that he was, when, I, when they signed Durant, my concern was, yeah, you're adding the second best player in the world, but are you turning Steph from the second best player in the world to the eighth or ninth best player in the world? Now, they won a championship with it. They were the heavy favorites going into this series. So I'm not saying that they shouldn't have signed Durant. I, I said it a year and a half ago, and it's looked wrong. The point that I'm making is they... They haven't looked like the Warriors this series. They just fl flatly, offensively, have looked like a lot of really great teams have looked. we got a bunch of yeah. good players. We're going to go in ISO. Like, they haven't looked like the team that was a force of nature you know offensively. what it looks like is that Steph and Clay and the rest of their great players – are just deferring to Durant. I mean, how many times are they coming by half court and just giving it to Kevin and then mm -hmm. running away and expecting him to do something? So your uh, point I, is well taken. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you, you brought out with the, with the passes because we had looked at a couple games and they had been down 50 passes in a game or two. But now, over the collection of five games, that's 200 passes mm -hmm. over the course yeah. of the series. That's a lot less motion. It's easier to defend, and it doesn't play to their strong suit. We talked about in the um, segment before uh, about Golden State with the lack of continuity playing with the guys they're playing with. Mm -hmm. And then now if they're trying to not only play with different guys, they're going to play a different style. That's why they don't look like the Warriors. But to me, it's just lack of being tested in pressure situations. It's not that big of an adjustment. The last two minutes of the game, they need to concentrate on what they're the doing. Last if, two they, games. if they can correct that, I mean, Signing Kevin Durant was well worth it and will be well worth it because now every team in the NBA is adjusting to what they did. It did get them another championship on top of the other one that they had. And you have to have, as a group, if this group doesn't win three or four championships, it's going to take away from them being special. Listen, and I know we're going to talk more about the Warriors when you're, when you're on with us later. I, wanna, I do want to give the Rockets credit because it's not just because they're a 65-win yeah, team. Yeah, they're making yeah, they, the they, Warriors It's not to, – to win a game – when Harden's 0 for 11 from three, and Trevor Reza makes one shot, and Chris Paul doesn't make a basket in the first half, is incredible to me. I thought they would go into this game and try to make, or of course they're going to try to make, but where they would shoot 40 to 45 threes, set it years, they shot 43 of them. They only made 13. Yeah. Like they, and we can say, oh well, Golden State turned the ball over. Golden State turns the ball over now. Like that's their mm -hmm. that's their bugaboo. They've been careless. The, the yeah, Rockets' the ability to finish these games and the Rockets' ability, even when they're not making shots, to stay locked in defensively. Because that's what happened, Jenna, in game three. Game three, they were within striking distance at the end of the first half, and they had missed a dozen layups, and they never started hitting their shots, and they let go of the rope defensively. In these last two games, even when their shots aren't falling, they are so locked in defensively that it is stifling Golden State. Well, they're going to have to be now. The one thing we all agreed on was that there was no way the Rockets were going to win if those two guys, Harden and CP3, weren't great. They both had to play great. Well, maybe last night was a silver lining that they won and they didn't play great because now they may be without CP3, pulled up with a hamstring injury. He left the court. 
even if he does come back, he's not going to be a hundred percent. He will still be hurting a little bit. H how does that affect everything moving forward? It's whether obviously he plays gonna, or not? Yeah, it's obviously going to be tough without him. But I heard you guys say earlier, and you're right. They can win one game without him. They, they can't mm -hmm. win a series against this team without him, but they can certainly win one game. I don't know how in the world this stat happened. But last night, Chris Paul was negative 13. He was the only Rockets plus player minus. that was negative in the plus yeah. minus. I and don't know how it happened. I either. thought in the second half, he carried them. And he's done that, obviously, the last two games. If it wasn't for him in that third quarter, I, it was tremendous what he did. So, look, you can look at that plus minus. Uh, there's another stat. There, with there, I'll tell you how it happened, though. It happened because the Rockets had that 11-point lead. He comes back in the game, and while they in the first quarter, and, and while they lose it over the course of the end of the first quarter, beginning of the second quarter, he's on the court when the Warriors went on their one run. That's why yeah. he ended up being negative for the what game. What happens if he can't play? Well, the one of the challenges is this. Uh, they have only played seven guys the last two games. And, and Gerald Green's played about 11 or 12 minutes each game. Mm -hmm. So they're essentially playing six guys. Now what you have to play at least seven, I think. So what role player that hasn't played in the last two games, and Bob Mute, whoever, gets in there and plays well and is comfortable after having sat this long. So that's going to be a challenge. Yeah, one thing, too, it's a challenge, but you also have Eric Gordon, who was in a slump. He's playing the best He's basketball he played in a long time. So you give him more minutes. Bel uh, Belmonte, you got to put him back in the game. You got to give him five to eight minutes. Like, this is a great basketball team. It's not absent of talent. Chris Paul, the other teams he was on, I would be terrified if he was hurt. The other teams that um, Dan Tony had, if their point guard was out, I would be terrified because because their number one ball handler would be out. With Houston, Chris Paul's not the number one ball handler. And if they didn't have James Harden, who is not playing well, but still waiting for that MVP performance, like to clinch the series, like what if he comes up with that game? So I, I put that in the equation. The 65 game wins, the athletic character that they developed during the season, and shutting Golden State down at the end of these two games, uh, games four and game five to win them, I believe that that moving forward will pay dividends. All right, Rockets now one game away from going to the finals. Nice. Chris, we'll see you a little bit later in the show. Coming up, could a Pro Bowl wide receiver be heading to the Dallas Cowboys? That's next. This is First Things First. Time for drawing the blank. We're sticking with last night's game. The Rockets and Warriors played an instant playoff classic. CC, the best performance in last night's game was blank. Man, hit the biggest shot, Eric Gordon. Mm. Super sub, man, comes off the bench like an extended starter. One of the best six men in the league has had one of the outstanding series after struggling in round one and two. And not missing layups in this game. He did hit the biggest shot, but I thought the best performance was Chris Paul. After not making a basket in the first mm -hmm. half, when Harden clearly didn't have it, that stretch where he kept the Rockets in it with impossible shot after impossible shot, even though one got retroactively taken away due to a shot clock violation, I, Chris Paul, to me, was the star of the night, which is what made the injury all the more bittersweet. But Chris Paul, to me, was the best performance. Okay, the Warriors will have to get over their Game 5 loss pretty quickly. They'll try to keep their season alive on Saturday night in Oakland. Nick, the biggest X factor in Game 6, Six of the Western Conference Finals will be blank. The guy that has to play the best two-way game for the Rockets to win, Trevor Ariza. Trevor Ariza's been playing great one way. That one way's been defensively. For them to win in Oakland, he's going to have to hit six or seven shots, probably three or four three-pointers. He only made one basket yesterday. He's expending a ton of energy guarding Kevin Durant. For them to win in Oakland, he's got to play great both ways. I say Trevor Ariza. A guy who I enjoy watching playing, I believe, is the most important player, and that's Draymond Green. Averaging only 11 points in the playoff in three series, only shooting 41% from the field. Like, he's a liability from an offensive standpoint, especially when they don't have Iggy to build a spread to court. I look for him to be the X factor in game number six. All right, on to the other side of the bracket where LeBron will be in Cleveland tonight trying to keep his season alive. Vegas thinks the Cavs will win, listing them as seven-point favorites. CC, the X factor in game six of the Eastern Conference Finals will be blank. I'm going with Cal Corver. And if the coach, Ty Lue, don't get him off the bench, I'm flying to Cleveland and slapping myself. I don't care what Boston, I don't care what their rotation is, I don't care who they're playing. 
That's one of the most dependable shooters that you have. And surprisingly, has played some of the better defense he's played in his career. Put the man in the game, Ty. So your X Factor is Kyle Korver. My X Factor is Ty Lu because I want to make sure Kyle, Kyle Korver gets plays. in the game. Yeah, we are sending the message. Right. Ty Lu can control whether or not Korver can be the X Factor, so he's like the X squared factor. Ty Lu, listen, you did really well in those two games back in Cleveland, making adjustments. Brad Stevens then made a adjust, couple adjustments in game five, and you did not comport yourself to the level of your abilities. Ty Lue's my X Factor. The real X Factor is JR, but we don't know where JR's head gonna be. JR, get your head right today. Come to the stadium tonight. I think, right. I think X Factor's the name of the strain. Go ahead, Jenna. Oh. Go for a long walk. JR, JR doesn't know either where his head is going to be. <laughs> Yesterday, the NBA released their all-NBA teams. James Harden and LeBron James were both unanimous first-team selections. However, not everybody can make it, and there are always some great players who miss this honor. Nick, the best player who did not make an all-NBA team is blank. Chris Paul. I understand he didn't make it because he didn't play the full – he played around 60 games this year. However – 65 win teams should be rewarded with more than one player on all NBA teams. And so if there's, I understand why he didn't make it, but to me, he's the best guy who didn't make it. I say Chris Paul. My guy is not because he didn't play enough games. My guy is the best player who played the best in this season who didn't make it, and that's Bradley Beal. Oh. Now, you're talking about a guy who carried Washington. I know we always talk about Washington. They're not for not get reaching their potential in the playoffs, but John Wall being out, Bradley Beal, he up. stepped his game yeah. up, and he's also, he is that two-way player that we very rarely talk about, so Bradley Beal would be my guy. All right, let's move on to the NFL now. Cowboys wide receiver Deontay Thompson said that the team's receiving core is looking to exceed expectations after the release of Des Bryant. So that got us thinking. CC, the team with the best receivers in the NFC East is blank. I'm going to go with the Eagles. And in the Eagles, the reason why their tight end is a huge asset to their offense. And getting Mike Wallace. I'm a huge fan of Mike Wallace. You can't teach speed unless. This is one of the few guys that uh, during the course of his career be like, hey, man, the guy lost a step. Well, the guy could lose two steps because he can run a 4-2 in his prime and now still in slowing down runs a 4-3. That addition to that passing attack, Nelson Aguilera continues to grow as a slot receiver. We saw Alshon Jeff Jeffries in the biggest moment Alshon come up huge in the Super Bowl. So I'm going with the Eagles. The Eagles are, I have no objection to that. I picked the Giants. I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to include their tight end in that receiving core. Because I think Evan Ingram no. is going to be an excellent pass catching option. I like the evolution of Sterling Shepard. And obviously, of all the teams in the NFC East, they have the best pure number one receiver in a healthy Odell Beckham. So the Eagles are a good choice. I like the Giants by a hair. It would be funny. The Giants coming off the season they had, and we like the Giants, or possibly the Giants is coming by back. By the blonde the hair. That's what. The blonde by hair. The by blonde a blonde hair. hair. Correct. That's true. There you All go. right, coming up. The kid I'll with tell the you yellow story. hair. I'll tell you a story about hair. No, 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 no you won't. I don't even want to hear that. He didn't tell me. He told another kid on the team. More things we're going to say that affect you guys next time. First <laughs> things first. He's like, son, to that. you are... The Rockets won game five, but may have lost Chris Paul in the process. Injured his hamstring in the final minute, had to leave the court. His status now for game six is unknown. Chris, do the Rockets still have a chance if CP3 can't go? Absolutely. I mean, they're a championship team. Do they have a chance in game number six? Yes, they do. They have the depth, even though they went to a shorter lineup rotation of seven players. He's not the pr predominantly ball handler. They're not dependent on him for to be their primary scorer. I believe his scoring and his ball handling can be replaced. They, listen, for a, can they win one game without him? Yes, they can. They obviously would like to have him. I know when he was getting into his car yesterday, he said, I'm going to play. I talked to Daryl Moore at 3 in the morning. Status is unknown at the moment, at least as of five hours ago. It was the team did not yet know if he was going to be good to go for game six. I, I think I, everyone should hope he's good to go. We should be able to see these teams play at close to full strength as possible. Hamstring's tough, CC. It is. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Tricky, tricky. It's a new day, so you know what that means. Another career accomplishment for LeBron James. He was named to first team All-NBA for the 12th time, passing Kobe Bryant and Karl Malone for the most selections in NBA history. Nick, how impressive is this accomplishment for From LeBron? From an individual standpoint, this is a, all you can ask an athlete is how high is your prime and how long do you stay there? 
LeBron's, the height of his prime is as high as any player we've ever seen, and the length of it is now longer than any player we've ever seen, save maybe Kareem. That's arguable. So, mm -hmm. I mean, 12, how long is 12 years? Jordan only played 11 full seasons in Chicago. Mm -hmm. LeBron's been one of the best forwards in the league 12 years, so it's a wild accomplishment. Yeah, it is a huge accomplishment. It also it gets him to, what if he can get to 15? 15 times first team all NBA, even if he doesn't get to the GOAT as far as Michael Jordan with six championships, these are the things that LeBron James, it changes the conversation. These are the points that people would have to make that would try to represent LeBron as the greatest player. It would have to be longevity. It would have to be the height of his, uh, the height of his arc. And also, man, we haven't seen anyone do it for this long. So for me, I tell Nick all the time, this is the path to being the GOAT. Damian Lillard was also named first team all NBA as a guard alongside the assumed MVP James Harden. Nick, should Lillard have made first team all NBA? I think so. I don't think Russ's team was good enough for him to get there. Steph didn't play yeah. enough. Kyrie, CP3 mm -hmm. didn't play enough. So a spot was available. Lillard led his team to the third seed in the West, played almost every game this year. He, I, he was on my ballot. The NBA didn't accept my ballot for the ninth straight year was returned in the mail, but he was on my ballot. Yeah, you had called on this about three quarters of the way through the season to see if he would be the number one guy. Would the voters give Steph mm -hmm. the benefit of the doubt? Didn't know exactly how many games Steph would play, but they got it right. He earned it. And also, let's not forget, that third seed in the West, that was out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Now, we mark them down typically because they didn't finish. Um, him and our friend of the show, CJ, they didn't finish the regular season in the playoffs the way you'd want to. But Damian Lillard played all NBA first team style of basketball this season. Absolutely. All right, back to game five between the Warriors and Rockets. Kevin Durant has been the Warriors' best scoring option during the entire postseason. However, his coach Steve Kerr still had some feedback for him about improving the team's offense as a whole. Listen to this. When, when MJ was with the Bulls, we had a playoff game, and he kept he kept trying to score, and he was scoring, but we weren't getting anything going. Phil Jackson said, "Who's open?" He said, "John Paxson." I want you to trust your teammates early, early. You're, what you're doing is you're getting to the rim, and then you're trying to hit him. I want you to trust the first guy, and then move. Still attack, still look to score, but trust these guys, okay? So those right there, those are my favorite moments of the game. When you get just an extra little look and peek into you know, how a game is broken and that down. Was more, and that was more than we usually are allowed to see on those little sure. audio cut-ins. They usually don't let anything that be construed as negative or anything. I was surprised TNT aired that. I was very glad they aired it. Go ahead. Yeah. What, what did you make of uh, Steve Kerr's advice to, to KD? Yeah, it's one of the great tools that as a former player um, that you have. When you have associations with other great players. It's the way Kevin Durant plays basketball, a lot of it Steve Kerr can't relate to. He can't relate to it because he didn't have that type of skill. He's a self-made guy. He's a gym rat. He's kind of he's like the, the second coach on the field. He's going to be uh, he's going to be a sub. He's going to be a situational player. He's athletically challenged. He's height challenged like Kevin Durant's not those things. So what can I tell? What else do I have in my quiver to be able to get a person's attention? So it's not only how much basketball Steve Kerr knows, it's all the other stories that he's heard. Phil Jackson, Michael Jordan. These are the resources that allow you to be able to reach beyond yourself to be able to like, it's not all about the coach. Right. I love the example. I believe Kevin Durant could relate to that example, and he went deep on this one. He got Michael and Michael Jeffrey Jordan, and to me, as a player, anytime you hear names like that, I believe a lot of times it helps you recognize the moment. One of the things I found most interesting is when I used to cover football games, so we'd go to media day or whatever, practice every Wednesday and Thursday, and I'd stand on the sideline in the bubble or wherever it was, and every once in a while you'd hear a coach come up to a wide receiver and explain something, and it seems so simple. I'm like, at this point in his career, the fundamentals of catching a ball, you're going to explain to him... It, it was ridiculous to me. Similar to, yeah, I know, you're so great, but maybe pass the ball a little bit more. It all seems so simple, but sometimes we think it's so overcomplicated that, that athletes want some very, you know, intricate, multi-layered piece of advice or something that we don't know. But at the end of the day, it's break it down, go back to the thing you know. You already know how to play the game. And maybe that's what Kevin Durant needed, something simple well, like try to share or throw I, the ball around. Listen, I don't blame Steve Kerr for giving that piece of advice. It was good advice, but Kevin Durant didn't take it. 
Like, I mean, that the, 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 the immediate possession after they showed this. Now, we don't know when he said that to him, but in, in, the, in the broadcast, they show us that. The next possession, KD gets the ball at the top, holds it for four seconds, takes a couple dribbles and makes a jump shot, and they show Steve Kerr, this is a great part of the producing of the broadcast, show Steve Kerr jump up off the bench and wave his hand saying, move the ball, move the ball. I mean, KD, look at KD in the wins now. No one can doubt the scoring. He has been remarkable as a scorer. He's giving you 31 points a game, 44%. That ain't great, but it's not terrible. One assist a game. And with him on the court, they've been outscored by 24 points. So an average of eight points per game. That's what he's talking about. One assist a game in their three losses in this series. Overall in the series, I think he has 10 total assists. Like, he's not... He's not doing a great job on the glass because of the where he's at defensively. That's not he, he's not able to really help you in that way because of what his matchup is defensively. We get that. But when you're only averaging one assist and 31 points, that and that's not the style in which your team's been successful. That's what Steve Kerr's trying to communicate to him. This isn't how we've won championships. I don't believe it's Kevin Durant's fault because the reason why they're going ISO and post up is because those are the sets that Steve Kerr's calling. Kevin Durant's not calling the offense. He's not coming down the court calling his number. You know, let's play, let's run play number four. A lot of times you look at the players' numbers and everything. A guy calls out the number that's on his jersey. Watch out. They probably run in his play. That's what the coach named it. All right. So it's a combination between the coach and the players and a style for which they're playing. When you have Iggy, who's been out the last couple games, all right, he's one of the best ball movers they have. When you have Draymond, He's one of the best passers and ball movers they have. They're not shooting the ball well. So even if Kevin throws them the ball, they're not trying to shoot the ball. We, we talk about Clay, what he's done. He's done. He's been off and on. And we talk about Steph. Steph's been off and on. So you can't talk about their offense without talking about all the other parts. This is the way that Steve Kerr has been calling the games. It's been very dependable going isolation to Kevin Durant. And when you ask him to go isolation, Kevin Durant's not going to have a lot of assists because isolation is to get you a bucket. To me, the test about Kevin Durant is since he came from OKC going to Golden State, has he gotten better? To me, he's gotten better. Now, in this series, they're not better as a team, but it's not his fault that they're down, and it's not his fault that his numbers are down. Assist-wise, it's a style, and the coach is calling more ISO. If you want the ball to move more, call more motion. All right, let's move on to some football. I'm going to call that one motion right now. Uh, let's talk about the Rams, who, like Nick Wright, had a very splashy offseason. He got a chain. They oh, got a yes. defense. You guys are unbelievable. Rams spent a good deal of time, of money, and patience. You write that, Jenna? I did. I wrote all of that, all the words. I'm sorry wearing sentence. the chain on the show. Y'all talk about it so damn much. We no should. Problem. You're already wearing it. Is it underneath? You're Zip it. it with a tie. Rams <laughs> got a keep to leave. They got Marcus Peters. They got Ndama Kinsu. But head coach Sean McVay looks like he's most excited about his offensive weapon. New wide receiver Brandon Cooks. Take a listen. Alert your ex on the go. Hold the safety. Hey, 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 Jared. How fast is Brandon Cooks? Oh my God, wait till you see this. The one that he caught up this side. Is that awesome? How about how fast Cooks looked on that strike? How about how fast Cooks is? Oh, that is, is that so awesome? Much. Sometimes you forget he's the head coach. He's like, did you see how fast that was? <laughs> oh my God, I'm the coach. He's a very fast guy. That guy's very fast. Um, see, see, are the Rams even better than they were now that they have Brandon Cooks better than last season? Uh, that's great video right there. Sean McVay, he's one of the exciting coaches, one of my favorite coaches. How he's changed the offensive look, the confidence that that uh, that the Rams have. The the reason why you know, it, people might be shocked because then like, well, they replace Sammy Watkins with Brandon Cook. Mm -hmm. They kind of basically have the same speed. Well, if you look at their 40 time, it's relatively the same. But Brandon Cook is a faster football player. He plays faster than Sammy Watkins. What are you saying, Chris? He's faster at the line of scrimmage. He has better quickness off the line of scrimmage, and his overall deep ball speed. I believe to be better than than Watkins. I believe he's a faster football player. So the Rams in their offense, I believe the way they do it with Todd Gurley, they will be able to get Brandon Cooks and use him better than New England did. New England relies a lot 
on the short pass, and that's not Brandon Cook's style. That's not his strength. He was very, very good with Drew Brees and the Saints going downtown or intermediate at the, at the minimum. They didn't use him that way in New England. New England's downtown passing game was not that great. Their explosive plays, not that great. They don't like to hold the ball for Tom Brady. So look for that as far as how Brandon Cook is different playing with the Rams than he was with the Pats. And despite the Patriots not using him to the exact ultimate of his skill set, he still had a 1,000 yards receiving. He still had, last year, a far better year than Sammy Watkins did. Uh, listen, I think Sammy Watkins, I thought coming out of Clemson, I thought his second year in Buffalo where it seemed like he was going to be a star, I think he has the talent to be one of the best wide receivers in football. He hasn't yet put it all together consistently season to season. My only concern about Cooks is we have only seen Cooks catch balls from Drew Brees and Tom Brady. And when we were talking about the Cowboys receivers, we talked about how much of a benefit it is if you have a great quarterback and how the ball can speak to you, how they can get you in your very best positions. Jared Goff, listen, I know he's the number one overall pick of the draft. I, he was bad his rookie year. He was very good last year. He's obviously, even if he continues on an upward trajectory, not Brady and not Breeze. He also now, he had Sean Payton, Belichick, and now Sean McVay. I think Sean McVay is a very good play caller, very good head coach. The only reason I wouldn't be bullish on Brandon Cooks is how much of his success had been about the quarterbacks he was playing with. That's something I'm not judging him on it. I'm just saying to me that's an unknown. Maybe you're more confident on it. What you thought of him coming yeah, I'm out of college. a professional observer of wide receivers. Brandon Cooks a hell of a football player. Regardless now, of who's throwing him the ball. Regardless. that I, I hate when people discredit you for being successful because if he hadn't played well, man, we would have, we would have, oh man, you got Drew Brees, you got a great offense, you got a play caller. Like what? But now the guy does well, so we're going to hold it against him? All we've seen Brandon Cook is do well in the NFL. So why wouldn't we think that he would do well? The, I, and I, I want to make clear, I wasn't trying to hold it against him. No, all, I'm just but... saying we shouldn't be thinking that he's not going to do well when all he's done is do well. We think Sammy Watkins has all the potential. He hadn't. Sammy Watkins is the reason why coaches get fired, the reason why you look bad as an analyst, because he's got everything that you would think, but he's not consistent. He hadn't been the number one guy. He hadn't been dependable. Brandon Cook has been all those things. And let's not forget what Bill Belichick and Tom Brady said when they first got Brandon Cook. You know something? What's the thing that you think that sets him apart than other guys? He said, man, he's such a mature and responsible guy. And now coming from the New England locker room, that's where wide receivers have had a hard time adjusting. Remember, they couldn't learn the playbook. So are we going to give Brandon Cook credit for that? Absolutely. In one season, had 1,000 right. yards with New England. The only reason why they traded him, because they didn't want to give him 12 to $15 million to ask him price for free agent wide receivers. All right, we've got to take a break. We'll leave it there. Coming up, will tonight be LeBron Cle LeBron's Cleveland farewell? Ooh. That's next on First Things First. Welcome back to First Things First. Chris Broussard is back with us. You see me over there, Chris? Yes. Oh, what's yes. It? We're talking about glasses. I didn't know that CC had hey, ophthalmology. amazing, incredible vision. Incredible vision. Yeah, of, listen, a big of, advantage in your wide receiving skills, yes. too. Ophthalmologist of America, Jenna Wolf wants contact lenses that only apply when she's reading. I don't know if why that's such a tough those things, request. It would yeah. just help me out. But mm -hmm. let's Your bifocals work great, Jenna. You look awesome with them off the air. Yeah. <laughs> Serenity now. They're hot, Jenna. They go with your dress. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Chris Carter. Let's talk about the yeah, Eastern nice Conference little librarian Finals. Yeah, Nick called you four eyes. <laughs> he I called said, me what four eyes? Long. Game six tonight in Cleveland, Broussard. Cavs down 3 2. LeBron James hoping not to be eliminated in the Eastern Conference playoffs for the first time since 2010. Chris, what do the Cavs need to do to stay alive tonight against the Celtics? Look, we all know what the formula is. Number one, play Kyle Corver a little bit. All right, play, or, play him more than you did last game. You got to defend, and they have defended well. Even when they lost, their defense wasn't really the problem. And then you need the role players to step up. Uh, George Hill, the two games they've won, 13 points a game. The three they've lost, 15 points total. JR, it'd be nice if he could hit some shots. And and the That's thing where is, we are with JR. Yeah, no, it'd be nice <laughs> just maybe hit a couple I'm shots. I'm gonna be honest, I've been that way with JR for about three years. 
I mean, and, and, and he came up big when Game they won it in 2016. Yep. Yeah, but you just never know what you're getting from him. He could be 2 for 15, 0 for 7, or he could be hot and give you 18 would, points. Would you say this is the worst JR we've had since the trade? This is the worst. He, he's been on the decline and mm -hmm. very inconsistent, like I said, for the past few years. And but this is by far the worst. I would say he's been inconsistent since they got him. But it used to be a couple good games, a couple bad games. This year, starting with the end of last year into this year, it's five bad games, one good game. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, the the it's one thing to be inconsistent. Corver's a little inconsistent at times, where he can go for 17 one but night. he's a bench player. Exactly. At, at, of he course. That's no, acceptable. That's no, no, no. But, I was, and, and, but also, Corver never goes three straight awful games. JR has gone six straight awful games over the course of the year. If we were being truthful, JR been bad for two years. All right? Since they won the championship, since that game number seven, JR has been bad. Now, extenuating circumstances last year. Had a family situation, very, very touchy situation. I can understand that. But if we're looking at it in its totality, in the last two seasons, J.R. Smith has not been dependable. So we looked at game number six. What can J.R. do? Because they don't have Richard Jefferson no more. They don't have Shannon Fry no more. They don't have some of these other veterans who used to come in and get them a bucket, get them a stop, get them a rebound. All what these option does Ty Lue have? What would you like to see? You, you got to just trust. You, I mean, you have to at hope JR. You got to just killed it. Rodney Hood. Because, <laughs> no, no, seriously. When, well, when, he did play him a little bit last game. Yeah. Only in the garbage yeah. time, though. Yeah, not yeah in but the when, when they when, when when they had that dispute if he was going to go in that game, since then he's been unusable. And when you trade for him, you're expecting to get that jump shot and that youth and athleticism. And this should be the most important time of his career. His contract's up. When you don't have him and Jr. playing that position. Man, man, they're going to be hurting. I, I, and I understand Clarkson plays point guard and Rodney Hood plays wing, but if you can adjust the rotation as such, whatever minutes you have carved out for the gunner of all gunners, Jordan Clarkson, if you want to try to give him to Rodney Hood, try to get him back engaged in the series, I'd be fine with that. This is, But this is where I, I disagree with you and I disagree with Chris. I think everything you're describing is what the Cavs have to have. It's mandatory to have, and we haven't even mentioned Kevin Love, to win a Game 7 in Boston. I have seen Boston on the road this postseason. I have seen the Cavs at home this postseason. I think what the Cavs need to have to win tonight is LeBron to do what we all expect him to do. I, I think, can they win tonight with no role player scoring 15 points? Well, they won games three and four in Cleveland with no role player scoring but 15 points. But they didn't points. score 15, but you had a number of guys are between, what, nine and 13. Well, I mean, listen, there, there's... He's the, going to need a little bit of help. Oh, well, they can't win the game with 60 points. I understand that. But in an NBA game, guys are going to score to some level. Like It's, it's very, very rare that we see a guy go for... What a, give me the number LeBron's going to go for tonight. I 39 points. I'd say 39. Right, right. If he, has 30, if he only there. has 39, How they get the he's going to have to get a lot more from his role I mean, the, 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 But again, that's the... I'm, I'm just using how you do man. Mm-hmm. Because I was hoping you gave him 45. I thought you was going to go 50. 45 or something. Well, like that. well I'm not going to say he's never scored 50 in a playoff game, so I'm not going to say he's going to You gonna know, do that his tonight. seven of his elimination games, or I'm sorry, four of his seven elimination games, he's gone for 40 or more. Yeah, I uh, agreed. I also don't think this is going to be a game the LeBron plays done in the fourth quarter. Maybe I'll look so foolish you just think on it's Monday. A straight blow. I think he's already I, gone for 40 I, in a game and lost. That was in Boston, and that's the only playoff game this year. LeBron's been great, and they've lost. There's been one playoff game all year where the method, where the, where the manner was uh, anything other than just LeBron be great and we'll figure it out. Like, now, the, am I baking into it? Yeah, that Kevin Love will score some points, that George Hill will not make zero baskets. Sure, they're at home. They've been better at home. JR's been better at home. And the Celtics have been far worse on the road. I just, I don't, I think game seven is going to be a war. I think game seven is going, it's why I said I was concerned when they were down 2-0. If it is going to be a war, what's Cleveland fighting with? What do you, you it, said it's going to be a war. You used the analogy. Mm -hmm. What they fighting with? Because well, if we, if, if the same problems we bring up for game number six, you're saying no because they're in Cleveland. Okay, we give you that. The Celtics won one game on the road, but we still believe in the younger players playing better, having a better game than we depend on the others for LeBron. So we do go to game seven. We make it your way. 
Every, everything you guys are saying about Game 6, I believe, applies to Game 7. I think they have to have George Hill step up. I think JR has to hit a couple shots. corver has got to be a big player. They have to have a thin, shortened rotation of only guys you can trust. I believe all that applies, and they have to play the level of defense we haven't seen them play in road playoff games. The level of defense they played Game 3 in Cleveland, where LeBron's flying around the court, setting the tone defensively. That's what I think they'll need Sunday. This is what I refuse to do. I refuse to set my Myself up that if they lose tonight, if they play like the Cavs I've seen play for over 90 games, which makes it possible for them to lose tonight, I'm not going to have those who watch the show not prepared for LeBron to lose game number six in Cleveland. It's we're being irresponsible uh, as, as broadcasters, like because there's nothing Cleveland has done that would have us going into this game. You know, some just bet the house on this. Just bet the house on the Cavs playing at home against the Celtics. No, that hadn't happened. Well, to your point too, a big question is: Is LeBron going to be tired? Because he was clearly exhausted in game five. And I think, look, we all know the track record. What, 98 games now this season? Mm -hmm. 15th year, all the playoff games. Now they have one game in between games. One day. That's a lot different than having two or three days in between games. So you wonder if that could be a factor tonight. And then if that's a factor, if they win in game seven. So that's a big concern, too. The other thing we should also think about is this could be LeBron's last game in Cleveland, I, in a Cleveland uniform. I think I, CeCe definitely thinks it is because whether they lose tonight or not, you believe Boston's winning the series. Boston right now is favored to win the series. And it, I got that baked into the pressure. So right? They, so I got that baked oh, in. For the, I got for that, the role players? For the role players. Yeah. Kevin Love mentioned it. Oh, yeah, not knowing what LeBron's going to do. It's been weighing on us. Well, it's going to weigh heavy tonight because the night is the last game. Wow. Well, and you said, could this be his last game? It, it all depends on what his motivation is going forward. If his motivation, as they've always said it is, is to win – like, if that's going to be the number one factor in his decision this summer, then he's got to leave unless they make some unforeseen blockbuster trade. Well, that they don't have the assets leave. for it. No. They got so the eighth pick of the draft and no go. tradable assets. And I think more and more it's looking like it's got to be Philly. The better Houston plays, he I think it makes – does LeBron go there if they're this close to beating Golden State? And even if they're not, well, if they lose this series, why go west – and battle with not just Golden State, but Houston and San Antonio if they mm -hmm. keep Kawhi. New Orleans is on the come Portland. up. Portland. Well, yeah. Minnesota. I, I mean, if, deep. If, yeah. if Houston does beat Golden State, though, is it Draymond or KD's job to call LeBron from the parking lot and ask him to come there? <laughs> but assuming he doesn't go to Golden State, I, they, they, you're, you still have it available that he stays in Cleveland, it sounds like. I feel like he's gone. Even if they win. Well, I, I've been there. saying all year the only way LeBron stays is if they win a championship. I don't even think that's the case anymore. I don't even think if they win the title, he stays. Well, let me tell you something. If he wins a title with that with that bag of bag of bombs that they got, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give him three. I gave him two for winning the that's first. Move him okay, up six, so right? yeah, two in Miami. I give him two for winning with the group of players that he so played with. So he's at four by Chris Golden Carter, man. Oh man, absolutely. And if he wins a title this year, he's at seven. They're the worst team in the playoffs, Nick. If we if we receive the tournament right now, the Cavs are number four. Yes. Oh, right now. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. Or left. But I so, want to get back to your point. Hold on. So he'd be at seven if they win the championship. Absolutely. With this team, he's always looking for goals. So hold on. So, so if they, so if they, so if they, so if they win the championship, he's the great. He's your greatest <laughs> ever. He passes Jordan in the rings and all of it. No problem. And okay. I'm willing to bet you a lot of money on it. If he these guys too. there, he I'm, would probably I'm, be I'm the best. I'm willing to bet a lot of money, but that's not going to happen. As far as LeBron moving forward, this is the scenario. LeBron, look down the bench. Would you sign up for three more years with them guys? <laughs> He's like, no, no, let's go. let's go. So where does he go? Or where, where should he go? I'm going with the young guns, and man, I'm going to Philadelphia. Yeah. I th I'm I think going with Joel Embiid. I'm going with a yep. post player. I'm going to play on the wing. All right, I'm going to play three. I'm going to play four. I'm going to be a great mentor. Try to get me two rings there in Philadelphia. Just shy enough, just enough to get him a statue out there under Rocky Balboa, <laughs> Julia Serve, and finish the second greatest player ever. That's a great, that's a great career. I, I, think th I think it's down to two, two available options, Philly and L.A. And I think the only way L.A. is an option is if Magic can somehow pull off not LeBron plus Paul George, but LeBron plus Paul George 
and Kawhi, or Paul yeah. George and yeah. uh, Demarcus. Or, yeah, we need some I tricky math. Mm -hmm. I don't think Demarcus. I don't think would be a draw. Okay, for LeBron. So then call uh, Paul Kawhi, George and Kawhi. I don't think San Antonio would trade him to L.A. If I'm San Antonio, if I'm trading him, he's going east. And, cause be careful think about now. They could trade the, him to Boston. The, the, well, here's another <laughs> thing. This is going to be different. Wherever LeBron goes, it's not going to be easy. Like, obviously, if you go out west, it's not easy. If you go to Philly, I think they're a great team, but Boston is going to be there. Yes, they are. So there's no, it's not like it's, no it's easy not going to be easy. There's no, no easy, easy path. path. It's not supposed to be easy. And like I said, L.A., to me, if he goes to L.A., they don't, and they don't get Kawhi and they just get Paul George with LeBron, it's, I, winning is not necessarily the end all for him. It's, I want to be in L.A., the lifestyle, my businesses. And yeah, we could win if things mm -hmm. work out. That's why I said, what's his motivation? Yeah. All right, Chris, stick around. Got to take a break. Coming up, who is to blame for the Warriors being down 3-2? Next on First Things First. Back here with Chris Broussard. Rockets beat the Warriors last night. A little bit of an ugly game early on, but a pivotal one. They now take a 3-2 series lead. The Warriors have now dropped two playoff games in a row. They haven't done that since the 2016 finals. But Steve Kerr is not worried. Take a listen. I feel great about where we are right now. And that may sound crazy, um, but I, I feel it. I know exactly what I'm seeing out there. And we defended them beautifully tonight. We got everything we needed. Just too many turnovers, too many reaches. Um, and if we settle down a little bit, we're going to be in really good shape. No shot, Broussard. No shot. He's, I, he feels great about it. And the only thing he needs to adjust is them settling down. No shot. No, look, the <laughs> only way you feel good, or did he say great yeah. or good? Whatever he Regardless. Said, the only way you feel good be being down 3-2 without the home court advantage is if at one point you were down 3-0 or 3-1. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, a good that's point. That's the only okay. way you no. were then you'd be like, one. That's, yeah, that's, no, that's a good way to look at it. Great advantage. point. They have now lost three of four. Four. I'm starting to wonder in the back of their minds, because this is Golden State's been a team that has dominated the league. Everybody. They've now lost three of four to Houston, five of eight this season. Is that messing with their confidence? Now, that was something that I worried about. Well, it, it was brought to my attention because I talked about how well the Pacers matched up against the Cavs. And, and, and Nick was like, hey, man, listen, this is not new, Chris. I was yeah. like, what do you mean it's not new? They beat him in the regular season. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh, the regular season don't count. He was like, they beat him three or four. Yeah. I was like, oh, you might be right. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, when you look at that, not only during the regular season, and I told Nick, game number three or four looked like the number one game of the season that we started off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Houston was game down. Game four. Game four. The only two times all year Golden right. State's blown a double-digit fourth quarter lead was game one of the season to Houston in Golden State and game four of the Western Conference Finals against Houston in Golden so State. So you start seeing some of these rare things happen that they have everyone else's number in the NBA except Houston. You've seen the last two games where they had a chance to either call a play or have one of their superstars either make a shot or make one pass. We're not asking yep. them to change how they're doing things. Just, just do one thing, late in the game better, and we saw that finishing out games is not their specialty. Well, and see, you said when Dan Tony was saying the pressure's on them, that coaches don't like, players don't like when coaches lie to you. Don't lie to us. I, Steve Kerr might be lying, but I think he's saying what he thinks Golden State has to hear. Yeah. I think he's – this team is the greatest front runners I've ever seen. And I don't say that in a negative way. No, no. They, they, they are the greatest – There are certain teams that are good coming back. There are certain teams that are good grinding. You know, there are certain teams that when they have the lead, they are a better, better football team. I mean, our basketball team, and that's what we see uh, with Golden remember, State. Though, they did rally in 2016 down 3-1, so you got to uh, get But that also, that. that team also had a different sense of invincibility. They were the defending champs like this one is, but they were coming off 73 wins, and down 3-1, they had the home court. They, you know, what I mean? and if we remember, we say they rally the one road game they played in that after being down three one, mm -hmm. they were dead in the water, and Clay Thompson yeah. went bananas. Yes, one of the greatest playoff performances ever. I this team, whether it is game to game or as we're seeing at the end of these games, possession to possession, 
is not great with adversity because they ain't faced none. This is the first series going into this series. You're saying because of Durant. I'm not this saying because with, of Durant. But I'm saying since. Durant. Exactly right. This version of the Warriors, they have since they got out of Durant before this series, they've never been tied in a series. Right. They've never been down in a series. They've never had a series go more than five games. Mm -hmm. Like this, all of this, they've never not had home court in a series. This is all uncharted. And, and what you're saying is right because we hadn't seen it. So it's not like we're saying going up to, to game number four. Let's say after after game three. Been like, man, they're they're great in every area. But now they're getting two close games. So now we've seen them in back to back games. They can't close out games. So it's it's we should be able to draw the conclusion this team with Durant is not great in those situations. More of the proof that Kerr is lying is that he is obsessed with passes. Right? He hit 300, he says, is the magic number. We got to get at least 300 passes a mm -hmm. game. Against New Orleans, they average 340 mm -hmm. plus. Okay? They're averaging 276 now. So you know he's not happy. You And we heard him talking to Kevin Durant about Michael Jordan mm -hmm. and all that. I, I love that he did that. But this all tells you he is not happy with what's going on. And also, I'm going to tell you, too, when to you get team. desperate, you go for your best stories. Now, when I'm teaching kids and everything, I'm telling you, I go deep for Randy Moss. If I can't get him, I go to, I go to Randy Moss. Like he went to, and they, and they, went, they line up. I'll be like, man, I get, let me get some Moss in. Man, he Randy Moss in this situation. Story. Just yeah. the way the last two games ended, just it would, seems like it would be so uncharacteristic of the Warriors, who have two, three great shooters who are almost always locks to hit a shot. And the last two games, they looked out of sorts. They looked like in the last minute and a half, they didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't know who was going to get the ball. It didn't look like they had a plan. Well, let, that seems uncharacteristic. If we can, let's just look at every Warriors possession after Gordon hit that three. Gordon hit a three to put the Rockets up four. It was the last basket the Rockets made. Mm -hmm. Look at who's getting the shots. I know Draymond made that. The Rockets are Big fine shot. with Draymond taking the shot. I, Quinn Cook. Look, I, here's the thing. Hold on, just real quick. Quinn Cook then, then Steph misses, and then on the final play, it's not only that Draymond turns it over. Where's Kevin Durant? He's standing out of bounds, yeah. and you're never going to see him back in the screen, by the way. You'll see someone running. That's Quinn Cook you see running. Durant's not there. The question is, what in the world did they call coming That's out of your timeout? Because yeah. why is Durant off the screen? The, yes. that, that couldn't have been the play call. I, I'm not mad at that pass. The pass was fine. Draymond just bobbled it. Yes. Was he going to try to go to the hole? And I, I, I can't kill that play for Quinn Cook. It wasn't a play for him. But he was wide open. That's a practice shot. Yeah, I, I can't get – I know he's – they got plenty of stars, but that is but, a wide okay, open I, And I'm not criticizing Quinn Cook. He didn't ask to be out there. But see, that Clay, Steph, KD, Draymond, Quinn Cook, that lineup, prior to this moment last night, regular season and postseason, how many minutes had they played together we all year? research. Zero. That was the first time that lineup been together on the court all year. And part of that is where you don't have Iguodala. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. the search. Here I'm going to say, because your point about adversity, I, I think Steph, Clay, Draymond are fine in adversity. Because, again, I got to give them credit for coming back 3-1 mm -hmm. against yeah, They got a OKC. couple championships. Okay, yes. exactly, and a couple championships. KD is the guy. He has not faced adversity with Golden State. And when he faced adversity, for the most part, he played well against San Antonio. He struggled when he faced in adversity in OKC. 17 for 48 in games five and six. I'm sorry, games five and six when they lost to, OKC, to Golden mm -hmm, State. Mm -hmm. He was 35% from the floor. 22 of 62. He yeah. shot 20. People forget that story three. because they, they want to blame Russ. it on Russ. Exactly. They killed Russ. But in games five and six, Durant, the best scorer in the world, shot 35 And the only reason we don't remember or talk about that blown 3-1 lead is because two weeks later, yep. in the finals, a different team blew a 3-1 lead. Okay, hey, now, KD, he said, he, I should have taken the shot in game four. I want to have that moment back. You said you believed in that. He wanted to have that moment back. He had hell of opportunities to, to have that, have moment, that back. moment back in game five. But look at him in the fourth quarter in this series. KD in the fourth quarter in this series is giving you three points on 18%. And 12% from three. This is five like, games now. And in the the fourth quarter of games four and five combined, one of nine from the field, zero assists. Like, 
Oh. I mean, this is problematic for this them. This is going to be... A, he's going to get the lion's share of the blame. Quickly, you lose. still think the Warriors pull this out? I mean, I, I'm the type to stick with my picks. See, that, I, you know, I, I, I believe mean, that. Okay. I believe in my in heart that. of hearts, where am I? I'm a little no, shaky. They're, they're <laughs> I'm the type to stick with my picks. Yeah, so you <laughs> picked Warriors. I picked the Warriors. There you go. You I, still have the Rockets in I had the Rockets in, in seven. Six. I'll take them in six. I okay. picked the Cavs in six. I, I, I'm sticking with that one, too. <laughs> they, they beat them so bad tonight, Boston will show up for games. I'm like you. New information, new opinion. Love it. Let's I go. love it. <laughs> love it. Or no information, no opinion. I don't care. Hey, Chris, thank you, as great always, job, for joining man. us. Great Have a great job, weekend. Good holiday weekend. weekend. Yeah.